Travel all over the countryside, ask the Leylands, ask the Leylands, travel all over the countryside, ask the Leyland brothers. Whatever it is that you want to see, ask the Leylands, ask the Leylands, no matter whatever that happens to be, ask the Leyland brothers. Come on, me in and then join in the fun, travel all over Australia. Today on Ask the Leyland Brothers, we're going to Denmark. Not the Denmark in Europe, but the Denmark in Western Australia, here on the coast, where we're going to have a look at a magnificent antique collection. And then we're off to Tasmania, to Carrick here. There we're going to meet a man who does some remarkable work with copper. Then off to New Guinea, up here to the Karawari River, where we're going to see a reenactment of a head hunt. The small township of Denmark on the South Coast Road in Western Australia is a popular tourist spot. The tranquil Denmark River and extensive beaches nearby make it a good place to stay for a few days or settle down to live like a couple from England who have made their home here. The township of Denmark has more relationship with England than the country of Denmark if you take into account Winniston Park which houses a unique collection of antiques from old England. We have a letter from Mrs Irene Yabsley of Lilyfield in New South Wales. She wrote and said, In May this year, a friend and I were in Western Australia and paid a visit to Denmark where we saw a modern home, but as we stepped inside, we were in another world. I would love my daughter to see it through your television program. I've never seen such a beautiful place. I would love to go back and see it again someday. Well, Mrs Yabsley, we're going to go and see it for you now, so you can see it again on television. It certainly is like stepping into another world, Mrs. Yapsley. It's almost like a time machine casting you back to old England, hundreds of years ago. The collection of antiques housed here is regarded as the greatest private collection in the Southern Hemisphere. This magnificent collection belongs to Winifred and George Harris. They came to Australia at the advice of their doctor, who suggested they should move to a more temperate climate. During a holiday trip, they fell in love with the Denmark area decided to make their home here. Sixteen container loads of precious antiques were shipped over from England. After a short while, the Harrises decided to open up Winniston Park to the public, and it has proven to be an enormous success. Before the days of Bayonet, and did one that way with vinegar, this one for all the world. George knows every piece in the house, its use and year of origin. These plates are washed over about 1900. Darby, 1811, they're hand painted. And the ones on the top, Dresden of 1880. This is the oldest piece in the house. A Parthian coin, nearly 2000 years old. Its actual date is 40 to 51 AD. This 1860 tea caddy has a lock on it, as they all have, because in those days, tea was a pound for a pound, and that was for 100 years, between 1780 and 1880. So they had to be locked up so that uh, nobody stole the tea. And tea making was a, a real ceremony. Inside here, there are two different compartments, one for your Indian tea, and one for the China tea. And you could mix them and blend them to your taste. The tea was used three times. They made a cup first, then the leaves were dried, used again, then dried again, and then the servants got on the third time round, and they had to boil it up before they got a cup of tea from it. The sunroom houses a Jacobean long table of 1630, and a wonderful array of Victorian copper utensils. These are horse bells that were used on the top of the pony's bridle, on top of its head. And when the carriage was moving along, and the horse was jogging down the road, you had the music as you were to travel. And to keep you comfortable, a carriage foot warmer. Here we have the original washing machine. It's a washing dolly and it's called the Swift Shore. 
It was used in a basin with the clothes and was pushed up and down like that. Soap went in the bottom here and the suds came out. The oldest book in the collection is this Book of Common Prayer, printed in 1600. This 15th century tapestry is in amazingly good condition after 500 years of use. It is starting to show a few signs of deterioration. This chair, dated 1649, is believed to have belonged to the Bishop of Salisbury and still has its original seat covering. An Elizabethan deep wood carving of Orpheus in the Underworld was crafted by Humphrey Beckham about 1565. Water jugs made from leather are 1585 vintage. This is the most famous bed in the world. It was built in 1553 for Queen Mary I's wedding in 1554. She was known as Bloody Mary. Queen Mary well deserved her nickname of Bloody Mary, as evidenced in the Book of Martyrs from 1700. Graphic illustrations depicting the barbarous practices of Queen Mary's reign of terror include these of the burning at the stake of hundreds of Protestant martyrs. The Catholic Queen was a monster who even had mothers with their babies burnt at public executions. Queen Mary looked about as mean as she was. Her marriage to Philip II of Spain was the reason for the golden bed to be built. The golden bed is undoubtedly the highlight of the collection. It was made by Benedictine monks of St. Jerome in Spain as a wedding gift from Philip II's father to the newlyweds. The bed head is carved from a single piece of walnut. The carving represents the arrival of the Queen of Sheba in the chariot of fame to Solomon's court. A leather statuette of mother and child also came as a gift with the bed. The bed alone is reputed to be worth a million dollars. A priceless collection of beautiful antiques on view at Denmark in Western Australia. Tasmania is famous for its copper. On the west coast, in rugged country, its mines were very active for many years. Now, some of the old mines and processing plants are in ruins, and copper production has slowed down. But in the hands of various craftsmen and artists, copper once more is making its mark in Tasmania. We're in the town of Carrick, in the north of Tasmania at the moment, in response to this letter, which we received from Jenny Davidson from Mount Druitt in New South Wales. She'd like to see one of these artists at work. She writes to say, when I was in Tasmania on my holidays, I saw many fine copper plaques and thought it might be interesting to see how they are made. So here in Carrick, in this fine old building, we will show you a unique craftsman and artist at work. The building was built in 1850, but never completed. It wasn't until Merrick Marrick brought the old building and turned it into a workshop and gallery that it served as any more than a grain store. Merrick hails from Czechoslovakia and has an ample artistic training at art school and sculpture work in Prague and his native country. Here he is using a unique method of working with copper by preparing it for flame painting. 
In Merrick's expert hands, the flame from the oxyacetylene torch produces a myriad of colours and effects. He said that he first tried to create flame paintings about 10 years ago without success, but recently saw a simple flower from America produced by heat on copper, and this rekindled his interest in the idea. He has now perfected the method, and after a great deal of experimentation, can produce the most remarkable effects. It's essential in flame painting to work very fast and he has to apply the heat on the back of the copper sheet before it has time to cool down. This is the difficult part, for the effect of the heat on the rear side of the copper cannot be seen on the work surface. Here, he creates by applying the heat in just the right way using the results of previous experiments as his guide. The flame painting is the latest trick developed by this man of extraordinary talent. In his time he has worked as a set designer for theatre, a stonemason, a coppersmith, a welder, a blacksmith, a woodcarver and an artist. All these talents come together here in his metal work. In the workshop he uses about six different metals, steel, copper, chrome and tin plated copper and other copper alloys to create and construct his most unusual hanging sculptures. Some of his work is functional, like candle holders, but all is artistic. Quite natural forms. It's... Some of his most impressive wall pieces are these galleons. These impressive works are sometimes two metres in height and employ all six metals to create the various effects. One of the larger lower level rooms of the building has been converted into a gallery where the public can come and view his work and buy some if they wish. Another of Merrick's functional works is the cleverly concealed bar. Here he keeps stocks of fine wines which he offers to visitors as they browse about the gallery. This personal attention from the artist who created all that is on display here is one of the exceptional things about Merrick's gallery. This uh, king-size work is not really for sale, but Merrick estimates it owes him about $600 in man-hours alone. His flame paintings cover a great variety of subjects, from still life to religious themes. Wall plaques are in all shapes and sizes. Some of Merrick's more conventional work includes souvenir Australiana, such as koalas, kangaroos and kookaburra plaques. He prefers to make the more unusual, but tourists buy all of this he can make. Perhaps the saddest thing of all is that on top of the mammoth personal effort to get the gallery going, shortly after this film was taken, the gallery experienced a disastrous fire all this work, years of it, and the entire grand old building were totally destroyed. But Merrick is staying on in Carrick to try again, in spite of his $100,000 loss. We've had quite a few letters from school children asking if there are any headhunters in Papua New Guinea. 
Well, we're in the Sepik area, and this area was very famous for the headhunters back in the old days. But now, of course, there aren't too many left. In fact, I don't think you'd find any. But uh, if you came to a village like this in a canoe back before civilization was here, you could quite often come into a village and possibly see a headhunter's raid. The village is peaceful, with hardly a sound. It is the middle of the day, and the women and children are inside the houses, out of the midday heat. The men of the village are out hunting, and won't be back until late afternoon. A raiding party from an enemy village is cautiously approaching. They land out of sight. Unfortunate young boy was caught outside the hunt, and with no resistance from the terrified women and children, the attackers carry off their wounded victim. Victory songs are sung as they paddle back to their village with the unfortunate victim. Arrival home with the enemy captor attracts the whole village, eager to join in the ritual of the head severing. Women and children join in the Sing Sing to celebrate the successful headhunting raid. The blood curdling songs of victory and the garamut drum beats echo into the jungle to broadcast the success of their attack. Other villagers within hearing distance will know a head is about to be severed and a feast will follow. The semi conscious victim is tied to a post in the middle of the Sing Sing ground. He hangs limp at the post for over an hour as a jubilation ceremony builds up and the victorious tribe are in a frenzy. It doesn't matter to the attacking tribe whether the victim is a man, woman or child, as long as the victim is beheaded to even up the number of killings that have taken place over the past years between warring tribes. The victim's tribe may retaliate and attack this village or capture a lone hunter or woman working in the garden to pay back this killing and so headhunting goes on for generations.
the time has come to behead the victim. An important member of the tribe has a beheading task along with a young initiate. The village witch doctor chants over the beheading. Once the head is severed, the dancing continues and the body is divided up and cooked, ready for the communal feast that follows a head hunting raid. The head will be decorated and hung in the men's house. It's not all that long since head hunting practices like this were commonplace in this area and this village. The older men in this reenactment told me that they had collected heads and ate human flesh in their younger days, 15 or 20 years ago. Some people told us that head hunting and cannibalism is still carried on around here in secret, and it will be a long time before it is stamped out completely. Today it is illegal to display heads, and the government takes a harsh line with anyone caught head hunting. Fortunately, the reenactment didn't incite these old headhunters to take our heads. In fact, I took theirs on my Polaroid, and they were delighted with this modern form of head collecting. Our thanks to Kundu Tours for organising this reenactment for our cameras. Whatever that happens to be, Australian brothers. 